Uh, thank you, members. Uh, we are going to first take a look at the Everett and Vanderweel Minute Investigation Report. All of you should have a copy of that report in your packets. If you can take those out and take a look at them. Uh, I know that members have gone through this and have some questions, so if the Commissioner um, Clyborne could come to the testifier table, uh, we'd like to go through some questions on the report itself. Welcome to the commis uh, committee, Commissioner. If you can please state your name for the record and who you represent. Good afternoon. My name is Joanna Clyborne. I am the Commissioner of Minnesota Information Technology Services. Um, Commissioner, I think uh, we have some members that have questions right off the bat. They've already contacted me about it. But do you have any introductory comments that you want to make specifically to the report? I, I do. Um, Madam Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am under the understanding, among other things, that the committee would like to discuss the development and improvements on the Minlar system as well as the findings of the external investigator related to the former Chief Business Technology Officer, Paul Meekin. Um, and then I believe also on the agenda today is the KSTP story that ran last week in regards to cubicle configuration. So let me start first off with a project update. As you know, the funding for the project in question uh, was the focus of much of March, in which we also spent most, most of March focused on ramp down activities as I had formed uh, this body that it had the funding not come in by the time we started March 1st, I would actually have to start the ramp down process. Um, this ramp down activity was necessary to ensure the complete transfer of knowledge and duties from the full project team to a skeleton crew that could be retained with the current resources for the remainder of the biennium. Uh, with additional funding that we received for uh, physical year 18 now in place, we're in the midst of ramping the team back up, seeking additional contractors with specialized skill sets that can aid us in the roadmap work ahead. Um, we're also in the midst of testing and resolving any defects identified in testing with our next release, and that release will be 1.11.2. As we all know, there were insufficient uh, testing done of the MinLARS pre-launch. We also have remedied these insufficiencies. Uh, we right now are running performance tests with every planned code release. Uh, even if it's a minor adjustment, we're still doing the, the full performance test. We've upgraded the performance test environment to match our production, so the live system environment versus a virtual or VPN type environment. And we are testing based on up to 10,000 concurrent users uh, at the same time. We are testing with full production data volumes, whereas before, only a subset of production data was being used. We have also spent time rebuilding all test cases and the scripts to focus on deputy registrar's most used transactions. My commitment, however, remains the same to testing as when I last testified, and that is I will not allow a new release to go live without the comprehensive testing and quality assurance processes being completed. Uh, Minute and DPS have also implemented a new decision-making structure to prioritize the needs of stakeholders and the focus on their most urgent priorities and needs. As this body is aware, Data Bailey is continuing to hold statewide meetings with stakeholders, as well as regular meetings focusing on improving communications for all those who use the system. The internal executive steering um, meetings have matured into a weekly forum of open communications, connecting systems, users, minutes, DPS, to review the progress, outstanding issues, and next steps. I am aware that the report in front of you, the Everett and Vanderweel report, um, that report was done with an independent external investigator. That complete report uh, was conducted regarding uh, Mr. Paul Meekin's performance on the Minlars project as Minnesota Information Technology Services B Business Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Public Safety. Um, that particular report, which this body has in front of it, substantiated several findings. As a result of that report, I terminated Mr. Meekin from his position on March 9, 2018. I have reviewed this report. I was very disappointed in its findings 
in regards to the processes and management and performance of minute services. Let me be clear that these findings do not reflect the expectations that I have of a chief, a chief business in, um, technology officer or any leader within our organization, regardless of the level that they hold. I acknowledge that all IT projects require a careful balance of risk, money, and time. And no IT project rolls out 100% defect free. But it's unacceptable to me to see a rollout fail based on lack of leadership and adherence to IT principles. I am not going to get into the specifics of Mr. Meekin. I'm, I'm aware he is here and he can do that on his own if he so wishes. But there were systematic leadership failures at all levels within Minute. Um, and over the last couple of months, even well before I received a copy of the report, I have taken actions within Minute to make changes. I've taken swift action to rectify the shortcomings that have been highlighted in this report. Again, as commissioner, I hold our agency to a much higher standard of trust and performance. I think you've already seen that I will choose the harder right than the easier wrong, even if that means I'm gonna be back in front of this body explaining my actions. Minute has many dedicated employees who every day do the right thing for the right reasons. I am proud of the work we do. We do great work, but we can do better. And moving forward, as I've indicated already, I will continue to seek organizational changes to ensure the lessons learned through this investigation yield the results and accountability Minnesotans deserve. I look forward to you discussing these changes, but it might help if I discuss some of the changes I've already implemented. 60 to 70 percent of these changes were actually implemented and decisions were being made by me before I even received the investigatory report. The good news is, is that I believe I was on track with many of it, um, but the report highlights I have much more work to do. Some of the changes that have been made are structural changes. One of the issues identified was leadership being insulated to team member feedback. That is, an inability for team members to escalate concerns and risks above their direct supervisors. In response, I am requiring individual team member status reporting and logging of decisions, issues, and associated risks. We are also instituting skip level meetings to ensure information flows freely and up the chain. The report also identified a lack of comprehensive regressive testing in weeks leading up to launch. In response, full regression testing are now run on production data with every release. Legislators should know that this adds approximately three weeks to each release and additional weeks potentially if defects are found. But it is better to find those defects ahead of time and before we decide to roll out. This report also references project auditors that were consistently noting the risks and that there may have been inadequate time for testing due to project timelines and pressures. I am committed to full regression testing, and if needed, I will have to dictate that the scope of work be reduced or adjust to deadlines rather than reduce time for testing. For me, the report also highlighted Minutes' overall project management and oversight structure. While there is enterprise-level reporting and oversight of the status of IT projects in the executive branch. Oversight of technical decision making on software application projects remain largely internal to the teams that are dedicated to the specific agency. So DPS, for example, in this case. I believe it is critical that we employ an IT project management oversight function that is independent of the minute team that is working at the particular agency at hand to deliver an IT project. It is not that I do not trust my CBTOs. I do. But as I've said before, in God we trust and all else we verify. And therefore, I want to be able to know when information is not flowing forward. I'm working on formalizing a, a, formalizing a peer review, which we're actually piloting right now as we speak, with a couple of our critical, high, what I would call high profile uh, matters where the, the chief business technology officers will present their case of what they're doing, the methodology, the governance structure, 
And that allows peers to be able to challenge and walk through some of these problems. And that is done to help develop and grow everyone in an opportunity to see their case or the project that they're working on in an external focus. Also, we now have what's called an Executive Project Steering Committee, which is chaired by myself and my deputy, along with three other Chief Business Technology Officers. Those individuals will meet on a weekly basis, and we are right now in the process of reviewing all the projects, and then those projects will have each Chief Business Technology Officer that meets the criteria for the Steering Committee come back and in detail brief things such as risk analysis and actions. Additionally, when it comes to audit findings, audit findings, we are now instituting a policy that says that those audit findings that are done at the at agency will also be required to provide a copy to the deputy commissioner and commissioner of minute so that I get a copy and it flows up so that I know when those audits are complete and what they are finding specifically. One of the other things I've done is I've recently held a town hall meeting with every employee in minute, no matter where their location is. Um, that resulted in 1,200 that we can count. Uh, and the reason I say 1,200 that we can count is because many people dialed in using a hub where there may have been 30, 40 sitting in a room listening, asking questions, but not necessarily individually dialed in from their stations. Talking about the course that we are at at minute, where we're heading, and encouraged open dialogue to allow for direct access and email to the commissioner. Uh, this was good and bad. It resulted in approximately 160 emails directly to me that I am in still in the process of trying to answer through everything from concerns to areas I should look at and ideas for improvement. And then lastly, because I'm concerned about anonymity the ability for someone to come forward and highlight a concern, maybe they're not being heard by their supervisor, maybe they see something that isn't right in any gamut of the businesses that we do, whether that is employee relations or is that technical on a project, where they can actually, and it's in production right now, they're waiting for my go to say this is the format I want, uh, that any member of our team, anywhere within Minute, can basically use this form to <coughs> highlight an anonymous concern or complaint that will come directly to me and that we can then be made aware of the issue. And they can choose if they wish to disclose their name or not. So if they are concerned about confidentiality, that they have an ability to communicate with me directly. And I have been meeting with some of our our team members when I'm not here in front of this body or other bodies to get to the bottom of this. With that said, I will leave my comments in regards to the KSTP story or the other issues right now until we get to that point. I appreciate that. Um, I've got some members on my list that are wishing to ask some questions. Commissioner, I've got uh, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Clyburn. Welcome back to the committee. Uh, I'm over here. Uh, right here, a yeah, little hidden. So, Commissioner, a um, couple of questions regarding the report. Um, who commissioned the report? Minute did. I'm sorry. Madam Chair, Representative Nash. Minnesota Information Technologies did. As this body is aware, um, when you have a, a issue within your own organization at the executive level, you contract out externally. We did not want any bias or taint to the report. Representative Nash. And thank you, Madam Chair. But Commissioner, um, I believe the delivery date was February 8th. Um, I'm not sure when it was commissioned or who made the decision. Um, but I believe you were in your job by that time. Was that correct? Commissioner Clyborn. Madam Chair, Representative Nash, my official first day in the office was February 8th. I was coming off of military duty for Super Bowl support. That is correct. Representative Nash. And thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner, um, February 8th, you got the, the job, and then you got the delivery of the report. Um, and if memory serves me, because the press put in a uh, data request, uh, they got the story last week, and it came out. And I want to reference a conversation that you and I had on the evening of the State of the State, which would have been uh, February 14th. And you had said to me that a bill that we were hearing at the time um, 
I believe you said it felt like punishment, looked like punishment, so therefore it must be punishment. And Madam, uh, or uh, Commissioner, we didn't find out about this report in, be, until the press had it. So to me, to quote you, uh, if it sounds like evasiveness and looks like evasiveness, it may be evasiveness. And I'm just wondering when we were ever going to hear about this report from you, because had it not been for the press, I don't believe we would have known. Can you maybe share the decision-making tree around that? Commissioner Clyburn. Madam Chair, Representative Nash. I have made it very clear that there was an investigation going on. I did not receive that report uh, on the 8th. I'd actually have to look at what date I actually got the report and, and read all 108 pages of it and digested what it actually said. Uh, plus the time for redaction is required with the privacy data law requirements because I knew that that was coming. But I also notified the chairs because they had asked to be notified. And so I notified both the House and Senate chairs. I notified Representative Torkelson by voicemail um, that the, comport the, rep the report was complete. I did not go into detail because that is not the purview of what this is about. This is a single employee a minute being fired. I do not generally have those discussions, but I'm aware that this body was interested in when that the report would be completed. I had that exact same conversation with, Rep excuse me, with Senator Newman while sitting at council tables, and I was asked about the Meekin report, and I advised him that the report was complete. It would be up to the body to request that information. I would be violating the laws that were put in place by this legislature had I willy-nilly handled out that information, because it, it deals with a employee. This is an employee matter, and I do not intend to create a forum in which we debate the merits of the termination of a employee in, mer in minute. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner, if I, if I heard correctly, you were essentially going to wait until we felt that we could ask uh, to get the report, even though you had mentioned its existence. And I, I just, you and I had talked long before <laughs> we came into session after you had been named, and we had talked about there being a back and forth relationship and transparency and trying to set right some of the things that had been perceived of the person that was in the office before you and you wanted to work with us. And I, I, I will be frank with you, and that's the position that you and I find ourselves in, which is great, but I'll be frank, I don't feel that this is very transparent. Um, and I would have liked to have seen this, as I'm sure most of my colleagues around the table, if not all my colleagues around the table, would have liked to have seen this because it didn't come out until almost a month after its delivery. And while heavily redacted, and I know, I, well, with the amount of black ink there, it must have taken a long time, um, but that seems like a very long time to get us a report um, that would shed light on the process that we've all been living um, long before you came into the office. So I'm just, again, trying to understand the decision-making tree that was there. Commissioner Clyburn. Madam Chair, Representative Nash, what you're asking me to do is violate state law. You're asking me to release a report which was not sent to my office in writing. Again, we are in the middle of, of uh, HR rights under the managerial plan that is being gone through through the various uh, appeal processes that uh, Mr. Meekin would have available to him. I am not in a position to comment on the termination or his his performance or anything along those lines. I'm here to discuss what is in the report when it comes to minutes performance and what changes I have made. I'm sorry that you feel that I'm being evasive, but I did call and let the individuals know that needed to know that the report was complete, but I do not think that I needed to call every member of this body to advise them on an individual basis that I had a report in my possession. I had made no evasiveness that there was a report being done but again, this is not about Mr. Meekin that I'm here about. I'm here about the performance of Minute and what we are doing to rectify the issues at hand. Well, Commissioner, when you actually look at the report, the report isn't just about <laughs> Meekin. It's about Minute and their performance and how they overall operate as an organization. As you yourself identified, there's many uh, areas and suggestions for room for improvement. Full regression testing, number one all of the user agreement testing that you have. All of this is highlighted as part of this report as some serious flaws within the minute. And what I think is more irksome or um, alarming to me as the chair of the State Government Finance Committee is that the minute 
is actually under the state government finance purview, and yet you never bother to call. And I think that that's problematic, because if we are truly going to set aside standards of how does Minute operate and how should they work, what should their budget be as part of the state government finance committee, I, I think those tools would have been helpful in the original bill that was passed here a couple weeks ago in putting the money forward for Minute. So I think that you can understand that when you're looking at this report, this is not just about Mr. Meekin. This is about Minute as a whole. Uh, so with that, Representative Nash. Well, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, having read the parts that are readable in the, re in the report, it discusses Mr. Meekin quite heavily. But my question is, it doesn't really discuss anybody above Mr. Meekin, and I'm just trying to understand in your analysis, post-mortem, if you will, um, what's going on with people who were above Mr. Meekin, because it, it would seem to focus heavily on him, but on nobody else who had responsibility over him. And having been a manager over IT projects myself, um, I would take responsibility, or at least want some discussion of responsibility for people who were above somebody who uh, made a mistake, well, but yet nothing is in the report. Maybe you could address that for us. Commissioner Clyborne. Madam Chair, Representative Nash, I, I'm not sure who else you want me to investigate given there's no one left within that leadership structure in minute to investigate. Okay. Um, I've got Representative Vogel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, I'm Glad you are using this as a working document because I was as well. Man, just a couple of questions um, where we're at. On page 39, it ref, uh, refers to the organizational chart being very flat and consultants reporting to other consultants. And, you know, just from my perspective, gives a little bit of a concern of conflicts of interest. I'm curious what's been done to, to rectify that so that as we go forward, whether it's with Minlars or Minute in general, that those concerns are addressed. Commissioner? Madam Chair, Representative Vogel, uh, one of the first things that we did is the span of control of any leader uh, to manage 60, 70 people, it's, it's just not feasible. We, we know that that doesn't work. Um, but the reality is, is we don't have a lot of room to grow state employees either that can actually manage um, this, this side. So we've actually changed some of the structure of the teams. We're working to reduce the number of contractors, reduce the number of vendors that we have, single points that we can access. Some of this is a nature of the specialization of the IT professionals we need. Um, I have been working both with um, my chief business technology officer, Joan Redwing, um, as well as DPS on changing the structure within DPS on to ensure better oversight and how the information flows and validating what our contractors are doing and what they are performing and who's managing that piece of that. Now, that is only one organization that I'm evaluating. I'm looking at not just that, but the structures of all other of our organizations, as well as how their governance structures work within the businesses, so that I understand where the decisions are being made between the business and the IT professionals hand in hand, as well as the stakeholders, by the way. Representative Vogel. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Commissioner, then we can go under the under or the the assumption that the uh, the idea of consultants reporting to other consultants won't happen again. I I would assume that we're we got at least that cleared up because that that really seems to be a, a an issue. Commissioner, Madam Chair, Representative Vogel, I am trying hard to get there. Um, I don't have the ability to grow permanent state employees. I, I apologize. I don't have the ability to grow permanent state employees. And so as such, um, I have to be cognizant of where that, that line is. And so I'm balancing not bringing on more people with managing the effective oversight of contractors. So in this case, I may have a lead contractor with the team, but they are directly reporting to uh, Ms. Redwing or a state employee that I have in place. And where I have a gap, I'm working on trying to figure out if I can employ a temporary, unclassified state employee that is within my employ 
so that I have those levers and then could let them go down the road when we no longer need that oversight. Okay. Thank uh, Representative Ogle. Well, thank you. Um, another thing on, on page 50, it talked about too many eggs in the same basket, basically referring to um, probably too many responsibilities being put on one person. And then on 76, it talks about a lack of competence. I'm curious how you have or what process you're using to redefine the, um, the, the basically the review, the employee review or the, the, the review system that will tell you all of that, that this is going on rather than waiting until it's too late. So is there a new system been put in place that would have this being done? Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative Vogue, I'm just going to stand for this point for a little bit. Um, yes and no. The, the employee appraisal system or the review system is, is set. It's a, a yearly thing that's done, although we have metrics to review their performance and where they are at. There's a couple of deficiencies that I've noted, and, and this is not necessarily uncommon in state government, and that is um, when we look at IT professionals, we often promote IT professionals who've been with the organization a long time, um, they've been managing projects for a long time, but we don't do necessarily a full review of both the hard skill sets and the soft skill sets. So soft skill sets being things like, okay, we're going to put you into a management position now, but how are we setting you up for success to actually manage people? Not just manage people, but lead them, and lead them through conflict and disagreement with potentially your bosses, right? I mean, that's how we want to develop our leaders. Right now, I'm in the process with Deputy Commissioner uh, Covey and working on a quarterly basis so that I'm meeting with all the Chief Business Technology Officers to talk about where they are with their skill sets, where they need to go. In any organization, there are various levels of proficiency. All of the CBTOs have various levels of proficiency. Some are more experienced in this area of aspect of program management or project management. How do we get them to the same level? Well, one of the ways is through the peer challenge board to develop them. It's working through not just technical development uh, and opportunities, and there's actually some stuff that I've already sent over to the governor's office in regards to even the ability to attend conferences, um, which the ethics rules prevent us from taking. If a, if a vendor offers something or a product is rolled out, we actually cannot uh, send an employee at, for free. We have to pay the registration fee, even though the organization may be able to pay the hotel and the lodging. That makes no sense. The most expensive thing of educating an IT professional is the registration fee generally. Uh, so I, we're looking at that piece. The other piece is, is to encourage frank dialogue and to encourage an ability to push back on my thinking as well as their thinking. I don't get everything right all the time. I'm willing to acknowledge that. And I have to be able to underwrite honest mistakes that our chief business technology officers make. Not moral ones, not illegal ones, not unethical ones, but honest mistakes. But in order to do that, we have to set the platform to catch these issues early by demanding the risk assessments to looking at project review and management. The other thing is, is that when Minute was brought into existence, it was not brought in with any funds at the operational level, which means I don't have the ability to create the technical audits needed at my level across the agencies, either as spot checks or concerns. And I'm looking, I came in late into the budget this year is when I took on this role. I'm looking at next year, how do I ask for that so that we have some of those core capabilities within my central office. Representative Ogle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one more question, and I would appreciate though on, on that too, is I, I know the it's a broad picture with getting the, the employee um, rec, um, evaluation system in place, but that we catch things earlier. Finally though, on, on page 67, it talked about risk management being a mixed bag, which was true for most projects in minute. And I know you talked briefly in your remarks about risk management, but more importantly, overall, what are you doing to bring a risk management system into place um, enterprise-wide so that we, we don't have this happen where we go back and have to fix, but indeed have a management system that takes care of it from the very beginning? Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative Vogel, a couple of things. That executive project steering meeting that is chaired weekly 
that's part of that process and those reviews for those projects, especially that meet certain thresholds. Um, the other piece is statute requires uh, a, a project audit to be completed, but what really is needed is a technical audit that needs to be done, and I'm working on changing those, those requirements as well within it. The other piece is, is there, there are a lot of projects, and we do risk. We do have to do risk analysis. We can't get everything right all the time. Do you want the product faster? Do you want the product less expensive? Do you want the product you know, with multiple features? Those all require time, money, um, and the availability of resources all require a balancing of that structure. It also requires me, frankly, to push back when, when I'm being asked to add to systems that don't have the foundational structure it needs in order to continue building on the additional requirements. And if I've got a concern that, that either the legislative office or the administrative office is asking me to take on a project and a timeline, there has to be a clear understanding of the risks of taking that on at a compressed timeline or compressed resources or, or whatever the, the situation bears. So that also requires, frankly, me need to communicate the risks back to you so it is clear that when a decision is made by, by the legislature, what risks are being assumed as part of this? Representative? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And no more questions. I know people have a lot of questions, but I, I would suggest that we look at this as uh, like a business would with their enterprise risk management process as a whole because I do think that that is a key area that we need to look at. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Vogel. And Commissioner, you know, I, I'm on your comments regarding you know, the staffing piece and, and everything involved, you know, what I'm puzzled by is, you know, of course, we get the media report that two and a half million was spent for office renovation. Obviously, that could have been spent for staffing. You have the issue of you've got 100 openings at DHS. Obviously, you know, from a managerial <clears throat> perspective, you can always transfer those folks over to do emergency work, if you will, for the Minlars piece. So, I mean, you do have tools in your tool chest in order to address some of these issues, and I think that we'll need to have longer and more extensive conversations about that when it's just state gov five. But those are just some of the things that pop up uh, to me in the line of questions that Representative Vogel had. But Representative Fenton. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to the Commissioner. You know, someone mentioned earlier about how heavily redacted this report is, and uh, we do understand Minutes' responsibility for, uh, to reduct non-public data, but um, how, as I read through this report and looking just at 32, page 33, entire findings have been redacted. Um, and how can that be? As well as it looks as I continue to read through that there's non-identifying information like frequency of meetings and such that have been redacted. <clears throat> So how is it that entire findings within the report can be redacted? Commissioner? Madam Chair, Representative Benton, I don't write the data privacy rules. Um, if it provides information that can be ascertained on who the individual is being questioned, a statement, a document written by someone that would identify who that member is, it cannot be disclosed. We use uh, counsel to make sure that this is not this is not Joe Clyborne sitting with her marker going through, I think you should have this, I think you should not have this. These are individuals with juris doctorates and law degrees who are looking at this to make sure that, that I'm complying with, with the state law. Um, the other piece, and, and there's not a lot redaction based on this, but the other thing is, is anything that could reveal sensitivity uh, of the system to exposure to the outside, so systems methodologies, those types of things that could be exploited by someone um, that would be removed as well, um, which makes sense because you don't want the general public to be able to exploit, uh, for example, a, a weakness in the system. But, but that, in this particular case, um, the items that are being removed here are items that may have come in from another agency. It may have been a witness statement. It could have been a, an email communication. Anything that would have identified that individual creating the statement must be removed. Representative Benton. Um, no further questions right now. 
I'm, I'm curious on the findings piece that Representative Fenton raised because that clearly is, is giving you a direction of these are the things that you need to do. So in looking at the other findings, they're not identifying somebody. So I think that we need to have further conversation about that piece as well. Uh, but Representative Ulam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, uh, thanks again for coming and uh, taking the heat once again. Um, I'm really interested in what we're going to do to move forward. I mean, I read the report, and I was really appalled. It was, it was kind of like Business 101 and a big F, a big failure in terms of uh, management uh, at the highest level and in terms of the lack of mid-level management and reporting uh, among the groups. And, and the org chart that was, was provided us in the report looked like something that had been really put on a napkin at a lunch or something. It was just, I, I wouldn't even consider that an organization chart. And what I've heard from you is, is you're, you're making some changes and, and everything else. Um, and we've, we've seen the, the failures here. Uh, there's absolutely no question about it. But what I'd like to know from you, you mentioned uh, running up the chain of command, and of course, that's your background, military, and, and I appreciate that. Maybe it's a, maybe that's a good thing. But could you tell me a little bit about your organization, about how you have it structured now in terms of management responsibility and how the, the flow of work gets checked and who's responsible and uh, who has who has the uh, ultimate say, yes or no? Could you give me a little background on that? Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative. Um, so let's start with the agency. Um, within each agency, there is an information technology team that is uh, led by a chief business technology officer. Well, let's call them, for, for lack of better words, CIOs of that agency. Okay, chief information officer at that, that agency level. In fact, that's what they were at one time before consolidation um, and there, there was a, a requirement to report back how many CIOs of the agencies there were. I, I suspect to make sure we weren't growing more because the thought process was you were supposed to consolidate somehow these positions rather than looking at the volume of work that they were doing. Um, those chief business technology officer, let's say the legislature dictates a new system. You want a new system built for an agency. Then they will basically, that chief business technology officer will work with the business to determine what the needs are, what are they looking for it to do, what does the legislature want it to do, and then we'll look at a build or buy analysis. So is this something we can go out and purchase? Does it exist within the commercial realm? If so, is it, does it meet our needs? Is it something we could adjust so that it meets our requirements? If not, do we have the capability to build it in-house? If we don't have the capability to build in-house, what do we need from the outside world in order to build it? They have those discussions. It gets let for contract, and then I'll let the contracted people talk about the contracting piece. But part of that is that then the discussion with Minute Central, so the headquarters, my staff, uh, at the executive level. And at my level, you have a commissioner, you have a deputy commissioner. We have a, a CISO, or systems, um, or cyber guy, basically, <clears throat> as well as a chief technology officer that handles the enterprise. Think your email, your voicemails, your computer workstations, those types of things. Um, and then we have someone that we just brought on recently to help with procurement and contracting, assistant commissioner as well as a assistant commissioner uh, for IT management uh, executive level that helps oversee these, which is someone I brought on recently to kind of help sort through some of this mess. Um, as the project goes forward, we let the contract, you know, in this case, MinLars was not a contract that Minute originally let. Remember, MinLars was actually created and, and decided before Minute even existed. So it actually originated <laughs> at that time from the business through admin. But he, Minute eventually got involved with it. Um, once the project goes to the start process, we work with the vendors, we work with the contractors. Uh, but the chief business technology officer working in cooperation with our partner at the agency really are setting the tone, the project managers that work for them, 
the process, what needs to be done, when, when are the <coughs> gates, what do we need. They work the budgeting piece. The budget, the money is owned by the agency, but the chief business technology with their team uh, develops the financial roadmap in cooperation with the agency because the agency is really the holder of the money and decider of what gets spent and what doesn't based on our recommendations. Um, when a project is going through its phases, uh, I can't really talk much about how it was in the past. I can tell you what we're doing right now. Okay. Um, and so right now, as that project is going through, I'm asking, and I'm, I'm playing what I would call alligator catch-up. I've, I've basically got seven alligators and six rounds in the chamber, um, and I'm trying to figure out which one I'm going to hit first to make sure that we don't have any OOs. Um, but I'm asking the questions, what does the governance structure look like? Are the stakeholders involved? What is the agreement with the agency? Who's making the decisions? Where are the, the checkpoints and where do we have to make sure that we're meeting the milestones? Through the executive steering committee, if that project, I get a portfolio right now every week, every chief business technology officer emails me a weekly update of um, concerns where they are. I meet with them regularly, especially if there's a, a concern that I have. Um, and then the Executive Steering Project Committee is right now going through each of the projects that we currently have in hand. And then we will be transitioning to our, what I consider, risk projects. Not because they're doing anything wrong, but rather because of the complexity of the project, the visibility of the project, or the amount of money on the project. Or maybe I want to make sure that there's some additional attention placed on that team for whatever reason, maybe development reasons, maybe just to give me warm fuzzies because I ask a lot of questions and sometimes I don't like the answer I get. Um, and so we manage it through that process as well. And that's the current structure that we have in place as of right now. I'm in the process of working a pilot where we do the business technology officers are able to do peer review on some of these projects. Why are you using this programming methodology? What, what projects are you doing? What are your risk assessments? And those risk assessments, by the way, also come to me as part of that executive steering committee on a weekly basis, which when I'm not sitting here, I'm in there um, on a weekly basis as well. That's where we are right now. It is an evolving process. Um, remember February 8th, and we are now April. So I'm, I'm working through this. Um, and there will be more changes to come. Um, and no one likes change but a wet baby. And my team is learning to, to deal with the pushback I give. And sometimes they don't like the answer. And sometimes, right now, the agencies don't like my answer. Madam Chair. Commissioner, OK, that's, that's a pretty complicated little business model you gave me there. Uh, do you feel that there are clear lines of management uh, delineation for, for responsibility and decision making with what you've put in place as opposed to what we had before, which was virtually nothing. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you think that what the path you're going down with this new management structure is going to be successful? You mentioned that it might be evolving, um, and I can understand that. Uh, do you feel it's also maybe too cumbersome? I do. Commissioner. Madam Chair, uh, Representative, I don't think it's cumbersome. But, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. And as agencies <coughs> develop to this new change, it may require some changes in our processes and how we do things. I think a failure to adapt when the situation changes is what leads to, to basically project failure, right? Because situations change, facts change. And that's why the Executive Steering Committee can help manage through that. I do think that there are clear lines of responsibility. I also think some of that responsibility to make it clear stops with me. I have to set the Chief Business Technologies officers up for success. They have to feel like they can come to me when there is a mistake or that there is a deadline they cannot make. And either I need to figure out how to get them the resources to make it or I need to handle the risk appropriately. But if they are afraid to come forward to tell me that there's a problem, the day my chief business technology officers are afraid to come to me with the problem is the day I stop solving problems in our organization. Commissioner, though, I think you know, some of the comments that um, Representative Ulam, Representative Vogel, and Nash have already raised is uh, those are 
we want to know what the timeline is. We know that you're trying to make this effort, but when will you have these issues resolved that have been clearly outlined since February 8th of these are the problems? I, well, and quite honestly, I think that we knew these problems existed all the way back to the launch of July 24th. So what is your timeline for actually solving these, having the plan in place and being done? And, and not by the project itself, but even just the managerial side of things. When are you going to have that taken care of? Well, Madam Chair. we would assume that that would have actually been in place. So, Commissioner. Well, every minute I spend here is a minute I'm not in my office doing this stuff. I, I mean, that's the reality of it. I owe you an answer, and I owe to appear here and explain what I'm doing. What the reality is, is every time I'm preparing for these hearings, every time that I am... Um, working with legislators sure. to answer their questions and concerns is time that I'm not focusing on the agency and all the other things I need to do to put the guardrails in place to make sure that I am not appearing in front of you next year, assuming I'm here next year, that, that we're having the same conversation. I guess we, we need to have this conversation again next year so that I can show you exactly what's been put in place and what has put in place. But to ask me to have a 100% fix, any leader that walks into an organization tells you that they can turn it around in 30 days and know exactly all the problems are, you got a bigger problem than the organization at that point. I'm doing well, what I, I can do. I don't think that that's the issue. I think the issue is, is we're looking for, there's been clear delineation of what needs to happen. So you've talked about the regression. That's awesome. You've talked about some of the testing models that are in place. That's great, too. But as far as the managerial side of things, you've said that you haven't been able to put the people in place that actually will make sure that these problems don't happen again. So I'm looking for that timeline of when are you going to have these positions filled and that are going to be up to date on what Representative Uglum is raising as an issue. Madam Chair, it, some of it's money. I have budget constraints on who I can hire. And the agency does determine who, which positions they want to fill or not fill. And so as much as I would like to say you will fill all these positions, the agency is the one that funds them. Now, I'm working with each agency to identify those positions that need to be filled. So in the case in point, I've been having extensive conversations with Commissioner Dolman uh, and Deputy Commissioner O'Hearn about how we're changing the structure in DPS, and they've been very supportive. But at the end of the day, I also need to figure out how I can do this without growing people and making sure that the right hires we bring on are the right people. The structure I'm referring to are things like the pilot program. So I already have implemented the executive steering committee so that we have that oversight occurring. That's already done. But the part that I'm trying to also work through is the, the peer review process. I can't tell an agency, you will give me this person to sit on this board and do this because they, they're paying for this person. And so I got to figure out how to work with those agencies and those people to make that work. And that's why I'm talking about a pilot to see how do we make that feasible. I know where we need to go. I just need to figure out the levers of how to get there. Madam Chair, one, one final question. I, I guess I, I have a comment, too. And, and obviously, this is one of the biggest issues that's facing the legislature this time around. And we would dearly love to not have you come by next year and be discussing the same thing. Um, so there is a sense of urgency, and, and I know you're moving towards that. So hence my final question. Um, and outside of the resources thing, I disagree with you on that because uh, Minute uh, and the agencies have lots of resources. I think you just have to marshal them. And it's a matter of priorities, and I think this is the biggest priority the department has. But my last question is, what is your biggest, biggest management challenge right now? Uh, Commissioner. Represent, or excuse me, Madam Chair, Representative Vogel. No, oh, you, Glum. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. You've been on a hot seat for a long time. It's all good. Can't send me back to Iraq. Can't take away my birthday. That's yeah. all I got to remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> What keeps me up at night right now is twofold. The morale of my organization, right, so that they continue to see the light and know to do the right thing for the right reasons. The second thing that keeps me up at night is integration. So if we look at the consolidation, so when we look at, for example, the CBTOs, if we take the chief business technology uh, officers who've been in position prior to 2011. They were agency employees. 
right? So DPS, uh, DHS, whatever you want to call that agency. And then consolidation occurred and poof, overnight they were minute employees. But nothing really changed to bring them in to say you are now minute people, right? They still went to their same desk. They went to the same people. We just changed the name of who's in charge. And so I have to change that culture to get everyone to understand that we work with our agencies, we support our agencies, but we also have a mothership enterprise that we report to and we are responsible to. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, I appreciate you being here and also want to just thank you for your service in the military and knowing that um, the way that we work in the military, we're very precise um, with a, a plan development, execution, delivery, and follow through. How can you apply some of those principles today to your job at Minute? So that um, the question that I asked about a month ago when you were before a committee, where do we end up? How do we end up where we are? And you had indicated that our scoping wasn't right and that we were asking the contractors to do things without proper oversight and proper instruction. And you said that that was our number one issue. Can you explain today some processes that you've put in place to ensure that we can stay on task and the check process that you've maybe been, again, apply from your military experience into a um, minute before us today? Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner? Madam Chair, Representative, you cannot hold people responsible until they understand the standard and the expectation placed in front of them. So first, you have to communicate what the standard is and what the expectation is moving forward. Secondly, um, you have to assess the current situation and you have to develop a strategy to get there. Sometimes, as you know, you lose I hate to say it, the battle to win the war. Um, in this particular case, I am systematically working towards an end result, both changing a culture and the processes in place that not only develop and provide the resources and the guardrails needed for the staff at the agencies, but also provides them the top cover when they come to me with the problem. I have to create a culture that allows people to say this isn't right or I don't have the resources I need or I'm struggling because then I can assess whether it's a capability issue, a resource issue, or a competency issue, right? I mean, that's just the reality of it. The other place is, is I have to do con continual feedback. So once I take a plan, so for example, this project pilot that I'm looking at it doing the peer review, the reason I say that processes are going to change is because part of that process we know is that when we take a course of action, we continually have to refine that course of action, look at the metrics, look at the feedback, and are, is it getting us where we're going? Are we still having oversight issues? Are we still having all O's? Are we still being surprised by things? And then we have to relook at that process again. I don't think you can put a set process in place and assume it's always going to work. You're gonna to have to continuously look at the processes in place is it managing the risk we're expecting to manage? Is it creating the end results that we're expecting it to create? Will there be failures along the way? Yes, there will be. But are we doing the right things for the right reasons at the right time? And I think that's kind of the important process. I learned a long time ago that there's a lot of smarter people in the room than me. And by engaging our employees, by engaging the teams, by engaging the chief business technology officers, they're helping me form that vision and strategy to move forward. And so with their assistance, and some have given some great feedback, including how to alter the pilot that I'm looking at doing right now on how we can move forward with that. It's not a single line approach, it's a three-phased approach, to be honest, and those phases, as I see it, and it's not written down anywhere, is first off to rebuild the trust of the public and that of the legislature, to rebuild the trust of our agencies and those that staff those agencies, and to develop the processes so that we develop our technical and professional capabilities <coughs> to ensure that we are meeting the end goal requirements of customer service support across the board. Madam Chair. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, um, what I've heard you say to summarize is you're, you're open to a bottom-up 
feedback approach. I'm looking from a top down from you and the, and the deputy directors. What are you doing to be able to help guide that ship? As you, using your words, when you're in battle and you might lose some of those, but to be able to win the war. What are you doing as the new commander in chief of that, of that organization to be able to help us to move forward? Madam Chair, I'm setting the standard. I'm getting their back when they're telling me that something's not ready to roll out and I'm addressing it and not allowing it to roll out, even though I know I'll be skewered for it here somewhere along the line. I'm setting the conditions that say this is how we're going to do business. When I see an issue that I cannot live with, I terminate the employment. When I see a standard of conduct that does not live up to the dignity and respect that I require of all my staff, including my team, I do the appropriate personnel actions. I'm also showing up to the meetings, being at the meetings, asking the questions, digging into the reports, following up to the meetings, following up to the emails, making sure that I am present and asking the questions. I am setting the strategy, and when there is a question about how we're going to move forward, I make the decision, and I make it decisively. If, as part of that decisive decision, so for example, this project management overview, feedback comes back that says, maybe you want to consider adjusting it this way, and here's why. I will take that feedback, and I will look at whether that makes sense or not. But at the end of the day, I'm the one who's accountable, responsible for all this organization does and fails to do. And I will be back here next year with everything in place, explaining how I got to where I got and doing exactly what I said I was going to do here. Chair. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. One final question. Commissioner, um, you know, the people of Minnesota are counting on you. They're counting on us to get to the end game. Nobody really cares about the top down, the bottom up on this. They just want to be able to walk up to their deputy registrar like they have for a number of years, renew a license, renew a, a vehicle registration, transfer title. If you're a person with disabilities, it's extremely important that your handicap plates be able to be transferred from vehicle to vehicle. How, can, you, can you, in 25 words or less, give me confidence today that that's going to be able to happen on a go-forward basis from you as the, as the new in-charge leader in this, in this infantry or in this command? Because failure is not an option, Representative. That's 25 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam um, Chair. I've got one question, and then we're going to go Representative Kunesh Podine, and then we're going to have Mr. Meek, and I understand has requested to testify as well. Uh, for my question, what I'm looking for in the report, it identifies that in uh, early August, Minute uh, identified that Real ID would not be up and running by the deadline of October of 2018 of this year. And so I'm, I'm looking to understand what the timeline was. Is when, did you, when did Minute understand, was it early August or was it prior to early August that Minute realized that Real ID would not be ready to go? And then also, when was that communicated to the governor's office, and when was that communicated to the legislature? So can you give me that timeline? I can only, Madam Chair, represent uh, members, I, I can't talk about what was communicated to the governor's office or, or to the legislature because I wasn't here and I don't know, and the report doesn't identify, and I have nothing to tell me that's the case or not. Um, I do know that sometime in... Uh, August, it became clear that there were growing concerns. I don't know that they knew the extent of the issues at hand. I think they believed that they could fix the deficiencies and that they were relatively minor. My understanding is, is sometime in October time frame, uh, Minute was brought, excuse me, um, Microsoft was brought in to look at performance issues. And when they, when they opened the hood of the car, they realized that they had significant problems, far more so than what they had anticipated, which is when we brought Ms. Red Wing on in November, where the full extent of the issues became known, um, and that, that's where the roadmap and, and the legislature was informed through that process and then in January. As to prior to that, when they decided to split... Um, Bin Lars from Real ID, um, I know that there were some concerns about the time frame in which Real ID needed to be executed once the executive order was lifted. And they did not believe, given the issues that they were having with Min Lars, that it was feasible to continue on through that process. And at that time, there was a vendor who appeared to be able to do the driver's licensing piece, so it made sense to fix the issues that they had with Min Lars 
and move the real ID piece to a commercial vendor who could handle it within the timelines required. I don't know even at that point though um, whether they fully understood the full scope of the problems that Minlars was having. Well, I think what would be helpful, and for the sake of time, so tomorrow, uh, Stake Up Finance is going to be discussing more minute issues. So if you can come prepared to that committee hearing with that actual timeline, based upon the, the report, it says early August, I'd also like to know exactly when minute informed the governor's office, when minute informed the legislature. So if you can provide that to us tomorrow, that would be helpful. Um, I've got uh, Representative Kunesh Podine, and then Petersburg and Howe, and then we need to go on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I appreciate your um, concise responses. Um, it shows that what, in two months you have a pretty good handle on, on what's going on, and um, I really am really impressed with your your uh, view for the or your vision for the future. But I would like to go back to um, something that was mentioned earlier about. Um, the um, cost of recubing your staff. I know there was some um, discussion and contention around um, reports that there was money that was maybe better used um, towards the, the uh, solution of Minlars and instead perhaps used to remodel your, your um, staff areas. Could you please maybe talk a little bit about that and clear, clear that up for us? Is it okay if we get to that? We do have that later on. Oh, is that okay if we yep. wait for that a little bit? That's fine. Thank you. Okay. I've got Representative Petersburg and Representative Howe. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I'd like to start off with just kind of a, a curious observation, at least it's curious to me, uh, in regards to some of the timelines in which we're talking about here. Um, taking us back to January 1 of this year, um, there was very little of anybody's knowledge that we were any kind of we're short of funding for Minlars and, and putting the project forward. Matter of fact, this committee, the Transportation Finance Committee, uh, was still believing that we were going to be able to solve the issue within uh, the budgetary restraints we had. And then um, at the end of about a month later, this report became available internally um, to the department, which was happens to be about the same time in which all of a sudden there was a big um, a press conference about how Minlars was going to be $43 million short of a budget. Uh, and um, still being quiet, uh, there was then a governor's request and um, a final uh, legislation by this body uh, to fund $10 million to the, the project. And now afterwards, uh, we see this report that really indicates that there was certainly dysfunction in many managerial positions, more so than just the one CIO that was the object of this investigation. And so you, hopefully you can understand the apprehension that we have from this body about transparency and, and information that is coming forth, um, because we're, we're just always wondering what is not being disclosed that is pertinent to the discussions that are there. But in relating to the question, I, I want to just start off by saying, um, even back in 2008, we knew that this presentation, this uh, project, um, data systems, was a monumental project. Uh, if I compare it to construction, it'd be like building a 50-story skyscraper. I mean, it was that complex. And so uh, in this report on page 102, and this is what I refer to, under causation of software errors, uh, there was certainly an assertion that it had nothing to do with inadequate management or supervision. I question that apart. But the key that I wanted to bring up is, is, quote, rather, he learned later that someone caused the errors by not enforcing decisions made by the project architects. Someone told the software developers that they should solve problems and that the architectural guidance that they had received was not important, unquote. Now, to me, that's kind of like telling this 50-story skyscraper uh, subcontractors that are responsible for building all of the um, systems within it, not to bother talking with the architects uh, who had oversight into how everything works together. My question is, now that we're working on developing uh, Streamlined and trying to fix these issues, do we still have those uh, program architects in place working with this problem so that we have some sort of oversight in how all of these systems are going to interact <laughs> with each other rather than continually doing piecemeal fixes? Commissioner? Madam Chair, it might be best if 
just Joan here with us today. I can have Joan explain a little bit more of the architectural oversight piece. Um, but the short answer is, is yes, we do have that in place, but I'm, I'd rather have the expert talk specifically about that piece. If, if it's not too long. I mean, I'd want to take up a lot of time because we have a lot more, more to deal with. I'll take your word for, for that piece of it, and maybe we can talk about it later. And there's another piece to that, yes, which is the requirement that any of the audits, especially if there are not just project management audits, but there are technical audits, they have to now come to the deputy commissioner and commissioner so that I have an opportunity to review those as well. Okay, okay so we're going to pause on that, Representative Petersburg? Okay. Yep, yeah, and, and maybe we'll call that later, but I have, have one follow-up question. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, my follow-up question is, um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner, is at your stage of expertise and knowledge of MIMLARS, uh, do you believe that we still have a viable program that can actually provide the functionality and outcomes that were needed into at least the near future with a reasonable expectation of timelines and, e and uh, efficiencies in regards to finances? Commissioner? Sure. Sure. <coughs> Representative, I do. Um, there will be some hiccups along the way. I mean, that's just the reality of any IT project, regardless if it was large or anything else. But the fact that we're doing the full regression, we're doing the best practices, we're meeting um, with the stakeholders. Additionally, if you recall, there's some significant oversight legislation in a committee that we report back to on 1 May with each of the metrics and the state's uh, stakeholder feedback that is part of that process as well. Thank you. Representative Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Commissioner, and uh, good to work with you again here. Question I have is, is uh, it's, and I know we've talked about the organizational chart and the organizational structure. I would, I would really like to see you provide the committee with the current organizational structure. Uh, I think we've seen a, a cartoon copy of what it used to be. Uh, I'd like to see what the current organizational structure that indicates what the new span of control is, and 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 if you keep it abreast of that, the committee of that as you go forward. But my real concern is, is, is stemming off the question that was just asked. Some believe that Minnet does not have the skill set to do what's being asked of them. And so what I would ask, Commissioner, is what is being done or what has been done to identify the skill sets and the capabilities of the organization currently as it stands today? Commissioner? Madam Chair, Representative Howe, um, we are doing a gap analysis. However, I will tell you that Minnet is, in fact, capable of taking on projects like this. The difference is what are the processes in place? No other state has been able to successfully do that. So to say that we would be 100 successful no matter what is a fallacy of any IT project. I mean, I'd love to say that here, but one need only Google the amount of failure in other states. That said, success and what we can and can't do is a project by project analysis, which is why we always first look to see if there's been a successful commercial product that has been let out there. If someone's already figured out how to do this, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The way we got into Minlars is at that time, the only two people that were possible were HP and 3M. Neither of them had been able to successfully do it, but they were the only options available. If we don't have any other option and we have to make a decision, then we're going to move forward to do the right thing, which means making sure we bring the right people on with the right skill sets to conduct it. I can't turn back the clock and tell you that the leadership positions or what we should have done differently back then uh, can be magically you know, erased overnight. But I can tell you is that I believe that Minute is fully capable of doing it. We just need to make sure as I'm doing right now, that the right guardrails are in place to ensure that we are asking the right questions of the agency, the need specification, contract oversight, vendor uh, performance, as well as end product testing and release with stakeholders. Representative Howell, follow up? Yes, Madam Chair. So, Commissioner, as you do that gap analysis, can you keep us abreast of exactly what the outcomes of that so we can identify and have uh, some satisfaction that, that you are putting those people, you're looking to hire the right people or at least get the right, uh, how should I say, 
contractors on board to fill those gaps? Uh, Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative Howe, I can fill you in on the, the gap analysis. As you know, contracting is also let through the, the state contracting program. I have only a certain amount of control as to which contracts get let and which don't, but absolutely I can do that. I will also acknowledge your request for the current uh, organizational chart that we have recently put in place uh, as part of uh, the Minlars project. I will get that back to you. Should I also provide that to Madam Chair? Yes, please. All right. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate uh, your testimony. We have Mr. Meekin that wants to provide some testimony as well. Welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and who you represent. My name is uh, Paul B. Meekin. I represent myself. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much for allotting just a few moments for me to make a few remarks. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, I disagree with the premise of this investigation and the allegations against me. There must be a full analysis of Minlars so that we can learn what worked and what didn't to better improve how state government delivers IT systems. We will continue to see problems as we are currently seeing with METS and DPM at the Department of Human Services and we will continue to see very damaging impacts to the people of Minnesota if the legislature and governor don't dig deep into the many roots of the many problems with state IT. Investigative reports like Everett and Vanderweels that are conducted with an eye toward examining just one person's performance of a multi-year, multi-agency, multi-business, multi-million dollar IT project is so fundamentally misguided. It totally misses the point that Minlars and other systems like METS and DPM can teach us. There are things that work and don't work in state IT. Until we fully understand what these things are, it is the people of Minnesota who are the most at risk. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Meekin. Members, do, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Meekin? We appreciate your availability. There might be questions later on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Oh, okay. um, actually, is uh, Legislative Auditor Nobles in the room, too? If you could join us. I know some members had some questions for you. <laughs> Um, Mr. Nobles, if you can please state your name for the record and who you represent. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members, uh, my name is Jim Nobles. I'm the Legislative <coughs> Auditor. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, do you have a statement, Mr. Nobles, or can you at least comment on, um, I know, I think it was in June that you had issued a report kind of giving an analysis. It was uh, kind of a top, top line analysis. Do you have any further comments or have you been able to do any further analysis that would help the legislature in moving forward? Madam Chair and members, I consider the issues that you've been discussing today and over the last several weeks to be some of the most important issues that the Office of the Legislative Auditor needs to address, and we are. And we're doing that in a variety of ways. We're specifically doing a financial audit of the financial transactions of MNLARS. We are also conducting an investigation of the central question, and that is what went wrong with MNLARS. And even as a subpart of that, which uh, was asked earlier, why was the legislature and potentially the governor not informed sooner that there was uh, a need for additional resources? Um, we fully understand we were a part of the communication uh, that you were a part of, that uh, the departments involved, the Department of Public Safety, 
and uh, Minute had adequate resources going into this year to complete uh, Minlar's. And then there was the announcement f and request for $43 million. So we are looking into the timeline of what was known by whom and how it was communicated. So that's another piece of what we're looking at. In addition, um, we have been tasked by the legislature to hire uh, an IT auditor, and we're in the process of doing that, to do a technical analysis of the current status of MNLARS and the path forward, and to work with the steering committee that you set up to determine whether or not we should continue on the current path to fix MNLARS or choose a different path to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So, Madam Chair and members, uh, we feel that uh, we need to be partners with you, obviously, on this task of not only figuring out what went wrong, but how we go forward and not have this happen again. And the final thing I would say is the bigger question, which I think Mr. Meekin just raised, and that is we are doing an evaluation of MINUTE. And uh, certainly MNLARS will be a case study, uh, but we will look more broadly at other issues as well. I personally am managing that project. I will have uh, several members of my team uh, at the Office of Legislative Auditor working with me because I think that really is the central question. Do we have in place the proper structure, the proper competency to go forward with all of the other IT projects that we need in state government? And we will have that report for you at the beginning of the next legislative session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nobles. I, I think that would be very helpful for us because we want, we want when it, minute to be successful, but sometimes that means that we change rules. <clears throat> that uh, people play so that they can find that success in what their responsibilities are. So I look anxiously looking forward to that report. Chair Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson, Mr. Nobles. Welcome to our committees. Um, over the last uh, few months, I've had numerous reports of just plain financial errors, people being charged too much, in some cases be people being charged too little, uh, all sorts of reports like that, uh, and I know of people that have received uh, two sets of license plates and they're just sitting on them because they, they're they just wondering which set is going to actually work when they get their tabs renewed. Um, I know it's early in the process. I know you haven't had a chance to probably dig into all the details, but are we going to be able to set things right? Are we going to be able to straighten out all these financial errors that have been made? Mr. Nobles. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Chair Torkelson. Uh, first, we need to find out the facts of where the errors are, how deep and how broad they go. And then we need to find out uh, specifically where they occurred, why they occurred. And then we will need to determine whether or not we can do some reconciliation. And there could well be a need to go both directions. That is, some people may have paid too little, some people may have paid too much. So whether we can ultimately get to a reconciliation uh, I can't sit here and tell you for sure that we can. I know that I just read, and many of you, I think, are aware of a report you just received from the Department of Human Services, that they have determined that there were a number of errors made in the premiums paid by people under uh, Minnesota Care, and yet they are telling you that they cannot make a reconciliation and determine who needs to pay what to whom. Uh, so we may end up there. Again, I hope we can certainly uh, find those individuals who have been charged too much uh, and make some um, reconciliation with them. We also, of course, uh, want to uh, talk a great deal with the deputy registrars, and I know you're already moving forward with uh, making some reconciliation to the cost they have had with the problems that Menlar's caused. So that's moving forward. but. To the best we can, uh, Chair Torkelson, we will give you that information. Thank you. Uh, Representative Salk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Chair. I will defer to you as to whether this is an appropriate question or not, because I'm going to be outside of the purview of what I believe the topic is, but it is very tangential. I'm concerned that we don't have this happening in parallel in our systems. The MET system that has been brought up by yourself and, and by Mr. Meekin. Um, I think it is as bad or worse of an evolving circumstance. Is there a live awareness by your department in the process of that as in being in parallel with what, seeing how we are developing state systems 
that depend heavily on new and better programming for data management. Madam Chair. Mr. Nobles, if I can piggyback on that, I'm, there's the Minsher issue. Too. I mean, we have several examples of this, so yes, Mr. Nobles. Madam Chair, we have been heavily involved in the issue of Minsher, which then transitioned, uh, at least for the computer eligibility determination system, into METS. And so we have been tracking the problems related to that for several years. And so, yes, uh, in terms of the evaluation that we are doing of MINIT, we will certainly be looking at uh, not only MINLARS, but other systems development projects, and METS will certainly be one of those cases. Thank you, Mr. Representative Salk. Uh, Representative Rembeck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, Mr. Nobles, um, I just have been wondering if we, did anyone interview Hewlett Packard? I mean, have, have, has their um, understanding and, and involvement been thoroughly, um, thoroughly understood? I mean, I'm reading that they did roll out the first phase, and the phase is in use. It doesn't say it's not working. Um, you know, it, 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 to me, there must be some, something more there as to why that failed. Uh, what does that say about, you know, how this was developed? Madam, Madam Chair, Representative Runbeck, I think that's an excellent question. And certainly we will seek to <coughs> interview officials from HP. Um, I think one of the experiences uh, we have had over the years when we have hired uh, consultants to help us with systems development is that it's a two-way street. We have to be clear about what our business needs are, and uh, they need to then deliver the code that puts those into place. And I think some of you uh, go back long enough to remember another project that failed, and that was uh, Health Match. And in fact, the litigation that flowed from that failure was a, really a dispute over who was most at fault. Was it the contractor or was it the state? And uh, so we want to look at the situation that occurred with HP um, and whether and, and, and where really the blame lies, and it may be uh, uh, on both sides, as to whether or not uh, HP did not deliver or the state uh, was not clear enough in its business plans and in its oversight of the contractor. So we indeed uh, plan to, to the best we can, um, and it has to to some degree, depend on their willingness to uh, cooperate with us, uh, interview officials at uh, HP. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, thank you, Representative. Uh, one quick question before you leave the table, Mr. Nobles. Will you have access to the make an unredacted version of the making report as part of your investigative authority? <coughs> um, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, we will. We have made that request. As I think many of you know, the Office of the Legislative Auditor has uh, statutory authority to see all documents regardless of classification. We have made the request for the unredacted version of that investigative report, as we have made a request for um, all documents related to not only MINLARS, but a lot of other projects. We expect to receive those. Um, we have not yet. Um, I would just give you the caveat that uh, the Office of Legislative Auditor is also subject to the Government Data Practices Act. So even though we are able to obtain uh, not public information, and in this case an unredacted version of the Meekin investigation, we will not be able to share that with you. I understand that fully. Uh, Mr. Nobles, I wasn't asking for a peek. I just uh, am hoping that, uh, <laughs> that you certainly can, uh, can evaluate the report as part of your duties and your faithful work to the state of Minnesota. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.